Yo, this is Epistological Highlights, the podcast about reptile and amphibian science. My name's Tom Major, co-hosting with me as per usual is Ben Marshall. This is episode 178, and in this episode we're going to be talking about snakes, which we always like. We've got an endangered but pretty cool little viper species here from Central Europe, and um, we're going to be talking about the Hungarian meadow viper. And it's quite a conservation-focused paper, which we always like. Nice to talk about snakes being conserved. And this is a pretty cool little species. Nice little viper from um, Central Europe. Um, We're talking about ones in Kiskensag National Park in Hungary. Kind of similar to the adders that we have here, right? In appearance. Yeah, your classic sort of true viper, right? So no heat-sensing pits on these guys. They do not have heat-sensing pits, no. Which, you know... Obviously, that Shame would be them. cool to have heat-sensitive pits, but yeah. they apparently don't, they need, don't need them. them. They've been getting by just fine for millions of years without them. Let's introduce the paper that we're talking about. So it's by Mize Budai More Rak Radovics Banksik Wena Korsos Lengiel Vadas. And that's it. 2NE23. Got so caught up. Management impacts on three reptile species in sandy grasslands in Hungary. Mowing should be avoided. That's the actual title of the paper, published in Conservation Science and Practice. So hitting home the sort of take home message of the paper right there in the title, which is kind of a bit of a spoiler alert. Well, you know, these papers aren't designed to uh, hook you in, are they? They're (laughs) they're meant to convey information quickly and clearly. (laughs) So I think the whole spoiler rule doesn't really apply. But like you said, very conservation, very management focused on a, okay, you want to protect species. And this is a species that uh, I was going to say enjoys, but maybe just exists in. Maybe it does enjoy. I don't know. It's a grassland species, right? It's a meadow species. and Yeah, that's right. Hence the name, Hungarian meadow viper. Right. So it knows where it's living. <laughs> it does. In the meadow. It's also very endangered. It's one of Europe's most endangered vertebrates. It's actually a subspecies of Vipera ursini. And the subspecies, which is the Hungarian meadow viper, is Vipera ursini racosiensis and like you say ben it's a grassland specialist so um yeah apparently likes grasslands although yeah calling it a grassland specialist it might just be that it can survive in grasslands which we've kind of historically created Who right knows? but it's presumably was occupying grasslands that were maintained through larger more abundant herbivorous grazing megafauna right that's the theory, isn't it? That like back in the past, and same goes for the, a lot of the UK, is that we would have had sort of grassland areas that were kind of maintained by large bovines, aurochs that are now extinct, among other large herbivorous animals, which we kind of hunted mercilessly to extinction. European slash bison probably as well, helped out. right? Yeah, for the yeah, European bison, which you know, there's another species which is making a comeback. Yeah, maybe we'll have yep. some of them in the UK soon. That'd be pretty sweet. There is already actually in the UK somewhere, isn't there? Some in, the, but they're in like a park yes. type of deal. But yes, yeah, so I don't think they're completely free roaming because I don't think they're allowed to be. But I believe I feel like there was some news about the first one being born in the UK for a very, very, very long time. Oh, that's cool. And that was yeah. I mean, it'd news. be fun. It would be good to have them back around. I mean, yeah, it's a common conservation practice here in the UK at the moment, especially with the popularity of rewilding and like trying to sort of naturally manage ecosystems rather than doing things which are too harsh or dramatic or like labor intensive is to release herbivores places. And um, hopefully they're sort of diversifying the landscape of vegetation and creating little ruts and divots for different animals to live. That's the idea behind it anyway. And yeah, so... We're talking about this Hungarian meadow viper, and this is a species which, you know, we've been talking about it likes grasslands, but it's faced a massive reduction in its habitat because most of the areas it once inhabited are now arable croplands. So these grasslands, you know, they're very fertile, and obviously that means that they humans like turning them to arable croplands. So a lot of the habitat's gone because of that, and so they've decreased their range, and now they're kind of stuck in sort of remote populations and even those populations that are left are also shrinking so yeah this intensified use of grasslands and that also leads to increased predator pressure because there's not so many places to hide if you're in an area which has got very short grass so yeah it's kind of um led to these hungarian meadow vipers kind of decreasing a lot and being left in a lot of small populations 
And these grasslands where they live, it's all part of this Pannonian Basin, which is this massive basin in southeast central Europe that covers about 130,000 square kilometers. And it's all this like fertile land. They used to be widespread across this whole area, but now they're kind of limited to smaller areas. But there's been quite a lot of research into these grasslands and sort of what influences how diverse the species that live there are. And there was some research in the 80s that suggested that there were more kinds of species in semi-natural grasslands which were grazed or mowed, sort of as opposed to grasslands which were left to be unmanaged or abandoned, which tended to sort of become quite woody and then just a few species dominate. This sort of like uh, gentle balance between hands off and just enough so you're not like kicking into this successional process where grassland can turn to woodland and so on and so forth, right? Yeah, yeah. Too much and you've got a monoculture of grass, too little and yeah. you end up towards a sort of completely different habitat type, which is more woodland because you don't have the sort of active disturbance of large herbivores. It's tricky. Yeah. Yeah, and like you say, if you put too many herbivores, so in this case, it's mostly cows. If you put too many cows out there, they're going to be causing chaos, causing too much trampling, keeping the grass too short. There's not enough habitats. But if you don't put enough, then it turns to woodland. So yeah, there's this kind of constant balance to be considered. But yeah, I think the take home is that this habitat wouldn't exist completely naturally. A lot of it now, because we've removed the large herbivores, probably, right. it would just turn to woodland. And so humans have historically managed it because we wanted the silage to feed the animals. And then you know, those animals either stayed or became reliant on this grassland ecosystem, which we've now changed our minds about. And so it's declining. The good thing is there is quite a lot of conservation going on for the Hungarian meadow viper specifically. There's this meadow viper life project started in 2004, which is kind of intended to safeguard this species by expanding its habitats. So national parks have taken steps to kind of implement grassland management practices that are sort of considerate of the viper's needs and to sort of strengthen populations by adding more more individuals from other populations so ex situ breeding and then releasing but you know there's all this goodwill to try and save this viper but fundamentally we still don't really know exactly the perfect situation for the viper to exist in so that's kind of the whole crux of this paper is like right okay what regimen of either grazing or mowing is best for this species and then once they know that they can kind of relate that to its conservation so yeah this study is all about gathering evidence for evidence-based conservation which is good they're doing the hungarian meadow viper they also threw in the sand lizard and the green lizard i assume because they kept seeing it at their study sites but also those, <laughs> well they, they recorded know, those a, are... a couple of other snakes too didn't they they had smooth snakes and grass snakes i believe yeah but not in high enough numbers to actually look at what they prefer. They would just happen to be there. Yeah, well, I wouldn't have expected to see... I mean, grass snakes, yeah, if there's like a riverine system, they could probably do with grasslands because they'll just be, you know, oh, be yeah. near the water. But yeah, I would have thought a um, smooth snake, grassland, those two don't really go together in my head. I think of them more as like a heathland species, particularly because their range in the UK is like pure heathland. And when yes. I've seen them in the wild, they're literally just like underneath crushed heather all the time. <laughs> It's their favourite place. They love it under there. Yeah, so it's all about comparing. They went to a few sites. It wasn't loads and loads of sites, but they did a few sites and they were comparing the sort of numbers, the abundance of these different species. So yeah, they had sand lizards and green lizards and also um, the Hungarian meadow viper. I know sand lizards are quite a big conservation priority in the UK. I don't know how much of that is. Yeah, I think they're a European protected species as well. I'm not so sure about the green lizard. I don't know either. We have them as an introduced species, the green lizard. There's some just down the road from me, although I've never seen them. There's oh. like, <laughs> there's literally like 10 bushes where there's supposed to be a population of these green lizards. What? I've never actually, yeah, in Bournemouth. Yeah. Huh. I've never actually seen one, but I've heard from other people that have seen them. But I digress. You're going to rock up and it's going to end up being an iguana? <laughs> That'd be so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to wrangle it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah they're comparing the sort of mowing or grazing regimes and looking at the density of these different reptiles and the picture is pretty clear right i mean yeah this is hence it being in the title mowing bad <laughs> mowing bad yeah they did a good job so you sort of mentioned there were a few sites looked at but the real kicker with this paper is that they did lots of repeats so going back to the same sites and and looking again and again and again and that sort of enables you to be able to predict or estimate the detection probability of you finding that animal. Because there's one thing going to a place and not finding the snake. Okay, well, was it that the snake wasn't there or was it that you just didn't see the snake but it was there? 
if you keep going again and again and again, eventually you sort of like, okay, well, we know the snake is here. We've seen them once. But of the other however many times we went there, we didn't see them. That gives you an idea of how likely you are to see them. And therefore, if you're at another place that you never saw them, you have an idea of how likely you would have been to have missed them all of the times, despite them being there. Yep. That was wordy and convoluted, but the point is... <laughs> I liked it. Getting an idea was... of how likely you are to see the animal, even if you didn't see them at every single site. That's, yeah, that's the real on. benefit of this study and their study design that they went for. And the reality of being an ecologist is also that you get to go to places that definitely don't have the animal you're looking for lots and lots and lots of times yes. before you can say that you're sure. Especially if you're working with snakes. Even if it's really crushingly obvious that there won't be any snakes there. Yep. You've got to keep trying. You've got to keep trying because uh, you've got to be sure. Otherwise, when you analyse your results, you'll be like, oh, those 95 trips I made were in vain. If only I'd made 120, then they would have not been in vain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, snakes. Yeah. It's maybe not that many. But yeah, so um, the results were pretty clear. Very clear. Mowing is bad. Mowing in conjunction with grazing is bad. Grazing, good. So yeah, you want some nice low density cattle going on there and sort of helping create or helping to maintain a bit of vegetation structure. Grazing is associated with taller and more diverse vegetation. It's just imagine, I mean, if you mow something, it's just super short grass. Whereas if you allow cows to sort of lightly graze it, it becomes a little bit more diverse. It's easy to imagine. And so, yeah. 10 times, just to put a number on it, 10 times as many per hectare was estimated in the grazing compared to the uh, mowing plus grazing rotation. And they didn't find anything in the mowing ones at all. So, like, talk about a dramatic difference. 10 times as many snakes? Yeah, that's a big deal. And, you know, obviously... There's the dual threat from mowing. It's not just the fact that it changes the habitat, but also you directly mince them up when you're actually doing exactly. mowing. Exactly, yeah. Snakes didn't go evolve with mowers. Well, and the whole like disturbance of a machine vibrating the earth. <laughs> you know, it's not exactly like they're peaceful, peaceful machines to run over, run over grassland. No, and the park rangers locally were not surprised by this finding. They kind of had already foreseen that they were disappearing from mown grasslands in quite a short period Mm -hmm. so yeah the kind of advice stemming from this is just to halt mowing really um shift towards low intensity cattle grazing especially where it kind of hasn't already been implemented but also it's kind of reinforcing the conservation measures that they're already doing which is probably pretty gratifying to the people doing them so um yeah 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 adding numbers to that to back it up yeah must be very gratifying yeah strong conservation for this um really nice little yeah like we say a little viper a little zigzag down its back like gray snake or gray sort of light brown snake with a dark zigzag down its back classic little viper um yeah fingers crossed that we can uh, keep these things going well and it's got added benefits too the lizards the uh what type of lizard one did really well sand lizard sand lizards yeah sand lizards had the same sort of pattern of higher densities in the non-mode areas and very very few to nothing in the mode areas whereas Green lizards didn't care. They were just sort of... They didn't seem to care. <laughs> yeah, they're just, they were just... They were in low really densities everywhere. Yeah. But also they were just in lower densities overall, really, compared to the others for... Yeah. When in the sort of prime grazed areas, so... Right. Shall we move on from a viper species to quite a large colubrid species for our species of the bi-week? Absolutely. Okay, so we've got a paper by Jablonski, Ribeiro Jr., Simonov, Soltis, and Mary. 2023, brand new. A new, rare, small, ranged, and endangered mountain snake of the genus Olaphe from the southern Levant, published in Scientific Reports. So yeah, we've got a new species in the genus Olaphe. Olaphe is like... Well, it was once a much bigger genus with more snakes in it. It's kind of been split up, but this was like... All the rat snakes in the world were assigned to Elafe when they were first described. Or Kaluba, actually, but Elafe kind of collated them all. A super genus. Yeah, they've sort of been split off as time's gone on. Yeah, the study species that I studied, the Escalapian snake, was reclassified from Elafe to Zeminus, as an example. But these are um, large, non-venomous snakes from Europe and Asia. They're all pretty cool, mainly because they're quite big. They sort of tend, I'd say, to be kind of plain brownish 
generally. That's maybe a little bit unfair, but some of them look crazy, like Elafe quatol lineata, which is one of the ones that this species is that we're going to talk about has sort of been described as distinct from. Is quite a nice one because it's got four really thick black lines on it, which looks quite striking. Quite striking. Yeah. Hence the name quatol lineata. But yeah, beefy snake that one is over two meters. But yeah, we got a new species here from. Um, well, it's from Israel, Lebanon, and Syria. And so there's this population of snakes that was known to be in the genus Elafe, which has only been known to science for about 50 years. And it has like 400 kilometers separating it from other sort of individuals in Elafe. So that's quite a long, long way. Quite separated, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the genetic analysis they've done here suggests that they diverged like at least four million years ago, probably. So they've been separate for quite a little quite a little while and they've elected to uh yeah describe it as a brand new species and they've called it elafe drusii and the reason for that is they've dedicated it to the ethno-religious group of people from the levant which is the area it's found who are the druze and the druze are present primarily in the mountains of northern israel southwestern syria and lebanon which actually closely um, allies with where this species is known to be found and yeah, so also the most densely populated Druze communities are in Mount Lebanon, which is the main distribution range of this new species, according to the data they presented here. So yeah, Elafe Druzii, named after the Druze ethnic people, which is um, quite a fitting name. The habitat they're from looks quite dry and rocky, doesn't it? Sort of dry, dry and rocky. rocky, quite high altitude. A haven for a Saxicola species, I would say. <laughs> You're for one right. that likes small scrubs. Yeah. Shrubs. And... Uh, I mentioned that it's quite, you know, the other, the congeners in Alafa are generally quite plain, although not always. But this snake's pretty cool looking, I would say. It's definitely um, got a sort of a mottled base coloration, which is like grey, blacks, a bit of white, some orange in there. It seems to have quite a dark head as well. Yeah, with the classic sort of counter shading, dark on top, paler, paler underneath. Yeah, yeah, big eye. So it looks like an active foraging snake. Yeah. Stalking these rocky mountains with about quite sparse vegetation. A meter long, SVL. The longest one they had was one and a half meters, SVL. Yeah, quite chunky. Yeah. Solid looking snake. I, 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 yeah. It strikes me with the photos they've provided that the patterning is likely quite variable in its sort of intensity. Uh, you've got some individuals that have a lot more orange warmth to their coloration and some that are much more sort of black white without as much color in them mm. yeah yeah but they think it might be quite rare um apparently a lot of people kill them indiscriminately which is obviously a bit of a shame still but yeah nice that they've been described at least now we know they're there and they you know the authors go into quite a lot of detail in this paper about the kind of um the sort of um, region and its obvious instability, which could potentially have ramifications for the conservation of this species, obviously, because uh, if you've got countries which can't get on diplomatically at all, they're unlikely to collaborate on conservation efforts, although you'd hope that they could rise above it. But that doesn't seem particularly likely. So, yeah, nice new species. Hopefully it's sort of in an area which has uh, got not that many people. That'd be ideal. But, yeah, amazing to think that large species of rat snake in the genus Elafe can still be discovered even today. That's actually pretty mad. Yeah, it is. It's a beefy snake. For, we're used to the tiniest of frogs for species of the yeah. bye week. And... and we'll take them. We'll take those little frogs. Yeah. Mate, do you know how many species of frog get described every year? Uh, 250. 150. Not bad. <sighs> Close. Close. Yeah. All right, so I reckon that's about enough for uh, Elafe drusii, this brand new species from um, Syria and Lebanon. Have you got any other business for this week? I do have one little bit. I can't remember exactly what I said on the podcast concerning it, but basically one, I was one of, I think, about 255 authors on this absolutely monstrous paper, which is, which is, I don't know, I find fascinating, which is basically taking the same data set or two data sets and basically had 250 folk split into two groups analyzed these data sets to try and answer the same question now you'd hope everybody gets the same answer right same data same answer easy that would be ideal 
I mean, potentially it would be ideal, or it would indicate really rigid, uninventive thinking. So maybe that wouldn't actually be ideal. But the point is, <laughs> the actual, it's been done. It's been done now, and it's out in preprint, and it's going to pop up in um, BMC Biology soon. Um, I'll throw a link in the show notes to the preprint. But results are done. Results are in. So you, now you can see how 250 plus researchers analyze exactly the same data set to answer the same questions and see how it's not exactly the same. And it's one of those that you can sort of take the results in different lights and in different ways, whether you are mega pessimistic about it or more optimistic about it, because there was a lot of variation. So one of the questions was seeing how uh, blue tip fledgling success changed basically what led to greater or lesser success so you can imagine the sort of scenario okay what counts as success what variables would i put into a model to predict that what do i think would matter how would i formulate that model are there any weird outliers that i would exclude and all these sort of questions and judgment calls all get added up and will result in a whole variety of different sort of actual answers and conclusions the optimistic take is that pretty much all of them, the vast majority, suggested the same sort of answer, the same sort of overall conclusion, which is good. Because you think, okay, well, even if you sort of do a slightly different model, you're essentially getting the same answer, even if the specifics of the numbers are a little bit different. That is gratifying. <laughs> it'd be Yeah, if that wasn't the case, it'd be pretty nuts. Right, but this is the thing. So the, there was a second data set about eucalyptus growth and grass seedling success or something along those lines i didn't do that one so i'm not as familiar but that basically showed a greater mix of results in relation to whether it was positive effect or negative effect but the sort of suggestion is that the effect you know the true effect the real answer might have been actually closer to zero so you're more likely to get this flip-flop between positive and negative so more pessimistic take was okay well in this instance you could have people look at the same data and to get two completely different answers that would actually lead to completely different conclusions. You'd think that only one would be right, but I don't think any of it's quite as simple as that. But yeah, I think it's absolutely fascinating. I think it's wicked to see how, you know, just the differences in who's doing the analysis can have such an impact on the results you get at the end. Mm. I think it's quite gratifying to see that the sort of data itself is probably more important than the researcher for instances where there is a clear effect, like the blue tip one. But I think it also just reminds people that the choices you make during analysis do matter, and you've got to be careful of that, and you've got to be careful of your own, maybe sort of, not necessarily biases, but, but preferences for formulating questions or answers in a certain way, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything I'm sort of missing that you'd like to know? No, I think you're right. I mean, I think like, yeah, it's just a good reminder that we're sort of fallible animals ourselves. And like, yeah, depending on how you approach things, it could end up looking differently. Yeah, I'm not even sure if fallible is the right word, because it's not necessary. In these instances, you're never going to know the actual effect between, uh, I don't know, a number of blue tits in a nest and fledgling success. Because any model that you're running, anything that you're trying to sort of analyze in that front is some weird abstraction from reality. So you're never going to have that perfect model that actually describes the numeric relationship between those two things. So it's not even like some people are more right or more wrong. Because we can't really tell that because it's a weird abstraction. Even, you know, agreement isn't necessarily a good proxy for being correct, right? Because you could just have the vast majority of people being wrong. It's very unlikely because we sort of operate on the assumption that a whole bunch of experts getting together and trying to analyze the same thing, the chances are most of them are going to be correct. But it's not actually a guarantee of that. But it's the best thing you've got in the absence of knowing the actual truth. But yeah, it gets very philosophical very quickly of like what you actually care about. But um, I love it as a proxy. Yeah, it's very cool. It's a really cool idea to actually, you know, uh, kudos to her like, organized that because that must have been absolutely wild it nuts absolutely nuts yeah. uh wrangling herding cats 250 mate, plus thought. people <laughs> yeah amazing yeah well yeah congratulations to all 250 that's really cool look forward to 
reading it in, in full. Yeah, I think I haven't got any other business for this week. So I guess we can pretty much leave it there. If you want to get in touch with us, you can. Herphighlights at gmail.com. If you've got any questions or you want to correct us on something we said or you've got some comments on anything really just get in touch um, we're also on social media you can find us on there shout out to the um, patrons patreon.com slash herp highlights if you want to support the podcast yeah big ups and also it's Christmas coming up check out our Redbubble store redbubble.com slash herp highlights buy a t-shirt for somebody for Christmas yeah alright thanks for listening thanks for listening <laughs>